Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Stephen Hodgson, and I'm the Head of Publishing and Syllabus Development at AMEB. I'm very, very happy to be here today for the new Viola Syllabus and Series 2 Teachers Workshop, uh, which will be presented by the entire Syllabus uh, Consultant team. Hel Helen Tucky, Principal Consultant, Janet Fernandez, Level 1 Consultant, that is preliminary through to Grade 4, Raquel Bastos, Level 2 Consultant, which is Grade 5 through to the new Certificate of Performance, and Roger Benedict, Level 3 Consultant, uh, who will be here via pre-recorded video. Uh, level 3 covers, of course, Associate and Licentiate, and Roger also contributed to the new Certificate of Performance. During this teacher's workshop, our Viola specialists will take you through each aspect of the new syllabus and series two publications, including the grade books for preliminary to grade four, the new technical work and site reading publications, and the new manual lists, including the certificate of performance, which appears for the very first time in this new syllabus. If you have any questions on the material presented in this workshop, please do send them through. Uh, you can use either the chat or the Q&A function that you'll see at the bottom of the Zoom screen. There's a couple of buttons there, either the chat or the Q&A button. We'll uh, set some time aside at the end of the presentation for you to, to answer those questions, go through whatever questions come through. Um, and we'll also attempt to answer them in real time in the chat window. So the new syllabus and publications represent an absolutely vast amount of work from quite a large number of contributors. And so firstly, I'd like to thank each of the consultants for the project, Helen, Janet, Raquel and Roger, for their tireless expert and enormous contributions. At various stages throughout development, each aspect of the syllabus is also reviewed by a further panel, a, a panelist of uh, specialist teachers, and this included Loretta Finn, Danielle Arcaro, and Phoebe Green, who provided incredibly valuable feedback to our consultants uh, on the gradebook, co uh, gradebook contents, the technical work, and manual lists. So thank you so much to this panel for their significant role. Uh, in the development of the syllabus also. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the consultant team for the new AMEB Viola syllabus and publications. Uh, although for many of you, these people will need no introduction. Uh, our principal consultant, first of all, Helen Tucky, um, is a viola player and member of the West Australian Symphony Orchestra. In addition to orchestral work, she particip participates in small ensemble work and is involved in community outreach. Teaching has also always played a significant role in her professional life. She has been involved in a range of professional music musical associations, including a period serving as OSTA National President. Uh, and recently she was honoured to receive a service award from the Australian and New Zealand Viola Society. An experienced adjudicator and AMEB examiner, Helen has a lifelong fascination for everything viola. I'm going to introduce all four consultants to you and then the workshop will begin so I won't have to interrupt uh, during the course of that. So the level one consultant that is for preliminary through to grade four, uh, Janet Fernandez has taught in a number of leading independent schools in Melbourne, including Wesley College, Presbyterian Ladies College and Scotch College, where she was the specialist viola teacher for 17 years until her retirement in 2021. Uh, she continues to teach privately at her home studio and as a performer Janet has worked as a freelance Baroque violist in the Netherlands, Germany and France and has had contract work with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra and with Orchestra Victoria. Level 2 consultant Raquel Bastos, uh, which at level two covering grade five through to the new certificate of performance is the director of strings at Somerville House in South Brisbane. An active and vibrant musician and educator, Raquel performs regularly with the Queensland Symphony Orchestra, the QSO Chamber Players Series, Collusion and Southern Cross Soloists. Internationally, she has worked with various orchestras and performed as a soloist and chamber musician throughout Portugal, the United Kingdom, Germany, Switzerland, South Africa, the United States and China. Finally, Roger Benedict, our level three consultant that is associate and licentiate as well as contributing to the new certificate of performance, 
his career has encompassed work as a conductor, soloist, orchestral player, chamber musician, and teacher. From 1991 through to 2000, he was principal viola in the Philharmonia Orchestra in London, and following that, the same position in the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. Roger was for nearly 20 years artistic director of the Sydney Symphony's acclaimed fellowship program and at the Sydney Concert Conservatorium of Music, where Roger is an associate professor. Roger is chief conductor of the symphony orchestra and also heads the viola department. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Roger will appear at, via pre-recorded video today. So first off, uh, I'd like to welcome Helen Taki, who will kick things off for the teacher's workshop. Uh, talking through some of the underlying principles for the syllabus review. Thank you, Helen, so much for being here and for your spectacular contribution to these new viola resources. Thank you so much, Steve. The four consultants here today began work on the new viola syllabus from the start of 2023, alongside the many talented specialists in the AMEB office. Throughout the process, there has been ongoing collaboration between us and the wider community of violist colleagues, publishers and composers. Our AMEB Viola Series 2 has been produced with an awareness of the past and looks forward to the future. AMEB Viola syllabuses have been around for over a century. In 2007, the Australian Viola community welcomed the first published AMEB Viola books, AMEB Series 1 a great achievement led by Robin Brookfield, Deborah Lander and Elizabeth Morgan. In creating our new and exciting Viola Series 2, we stand on big shoulders and are thankful to the community support that each one of us have received from organisations like OSTA, who've offered discussion forums, colleagues who've made suggestions, played through works and given feedback, and our students who've road tested pieces and exercises. One big advantage in designing a new AMEB viola syllabus is the ready-built scaffolding involved. For a start, we are Australian, and the AMEB has always strived to encourage and promote Australian creative content. Recently, this has extended to include contributions from our growing number of First Nations composers. Along with other arts organisations in Australia, the AMEB is also starting to explore the vastly neglected repertoire by women composers globally, present and past. In our search for repertoire, as well as from traditional sources, we receive great support from the Australian Music Centre, other, uh, other Australian publication houses, and specialists in women composers like Sleepy Puppy Press and the Boulanger Project. All AMEB syllabuses have overarching objectives as outlined in the Manual of Syllabus. These unify developments across all instruments and grades to support and promote a sequential and quality experience in a range of assessments. Parity with other string instruments is quite significant, especially between viola and violin, as students and teachers may involve, be involved with both. All four consultants are passionate about convincing and exciting music, breadth of repertoire and student engagement throughout series two. Earlier starts on viola are now possible with good mini violas available to suit age five and above. At grade five level, we might find a nine-year-old student who practices an hour a day on a mini viola or a teenager who's made a later start or a cruising adult amateur. Within each grade, there is scope in content to engage slightly different ages and levels. Early in 2023, the whole panel met and made important decisions, including about the descriptors for lists A, B, C and D, which are in line with traditional Amy B descriptors and will be outlined by each level consultant. The big news is the introduction of a certificate of performance level for viola, this needed to wait until there was a full review of the whole syllabus. You'll hear more about the certificate later from Raquel and Roger. Another exciting development is the launch of an AMEB viola sight reading book by Queensland composers and string teachers, Loretta Finn and Nerida Oestenbrook, a wonderful addition to our resources. A myth about the viola is there's not much repertoire, untrue. In January 2023, after visits to publication warehouses in the AMEB Federal Office, where composers had sent pieces for consideration, Level 1 consultant Janet Fernandez visited me in Perth. 
We worked for many days on huge piles of level one potential pieces, taking turns at playing viola or battling with the piano. The eventual result is the new refreshed manual lists and the series two grade books where studies and sonatas rub shoulders with world music, where you can find both foray requiem and funk, ragtime and renaissance, Bizet's Carmen and Amazing Grace, and pieces about dancing dolls, trolls, pirates, and even cockroaches. It's been a mammoth task, and I now welcome Janet to speak about the many musical adventures in the Series 2 Level 1 Viola books. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, in choosing the works for Series 2, I was thinking about a number of different factors. The most important part of our initial briefing process was the, the understanding that we really needed to bring the standard of the works closer to the expectations of the current and recent violin syllabuses. My own knowledge of the violin um, teaching material of Amy B goes back to series five on the violin and then many years of using the manual list on the viola until 2007 when series one was produced. Prior to the introduction of series one, there was no preliminary grade in the viola. So the viola had to be brought rather gently into line with the violin syllabus in 2007. When three octave scales were brought from fifth to fourth grade in the violin syllabus, the previous viola technical workbook had already been published. So the two instruments were again out of alignment. And I'm very glad to say that, you know, that's the situation is now altered and we're, we're back in alignment with the violin. The next important consideration was the latest starting age in general of the youngest violists. And although Helen has mentioned that, you know, some children can start at the age of five, that's still fairly rare. Um, very few begin before the age of seven in school programs. And there's a wider age range in general of beginners on viola. I have personal experience of starting many years, seven beginners in schools. And at the age of 14, I was a late starter on the viola myself. And I began on the viola. I didn't learn the violin first. So while there are many pieces that will be appealing to younger students, I've tried to have the majority of works suitable for a wide age range. When I chose music that's definitely suited to a more mature student, student I've indicated this in the performance notes. There was a dark desire expressed by our whole viola panel to keep the AMEB's traditional structure of list A as unaccompanied and or study-like material. List B, uh, Baroque, classical and simple traditional tunes. And list C, romantic, post-romantic and music in alternative styles. This ensures that students must present a wide variety of styles in examination. They get an understanding that the music encompasses a broad sweep of history. Occasionally, I did bend the parameters of the lists when there was difficulty finding enough suitable material, but in general, the lists do follow these parameters. And I think on the few occasions that I did bend the parameters, it was to put something romantic into list B, and they were generally pieces with more simple harmonic structures. In the lower grades, I have more accompanied works in list A but there's always at least one unaccompanied piece in the list. This gives students who use the recorded accompaniments um, an opportunity to perform without worrying about being in sync with the recording. And this can be very stressful in an examination. Across level one, we have music from the late 1500s all the way through to music composed in 2023, about four and a half centuries. And I think this is something to be celebrated. There also had to be a range of keys, tonalities and time signatures in each of the books and a range of difficulties within each list. I delayed the introduction of compound times until grade one in keeping with the new technical workbook. Each book is valuable to study as a whole, starting with the easiest options in each list and gradually working through to the more challenging material. With a minimum of four pieces in each list, there's definitely enough material to keep the average student very busy for an entire year. 
The inclusion of works in each grade by Australian composers and by women was also an important part of my brief. There are 11 Australian composers featured in level one and seven of these are women. There are also the excellent in-house arrangements of piano accompaniments and some of the viola duet accompaniments that are done by AMEB Federal Office staff. And I consider this part of the Australian content as well. The manual list has been significantly revised in level one with many works deemed too easy for the grade, either moving down a grade or being removed. Helen and I did a great deal of cross-checking with the violin syllabus to track down discrepancies in grading, particularly of works that are exact transcriptions down a fifth. When we were together last January, we played through almost everything in the manual list. Um, one of the most surprising examples of the discrepancies that we found was the very well-known Blue Notoriety by Karen Bailey originally in the manual list for viola at grade four. It was published in series nine, grade two for the violin, that's grade two, and it's now uh, in the new viola grade two publication. So that was a very surprising two grade discrepancy. Other works have moved between lists to reflect the structure of the lists that I mentioned before. New works and more Australian works have also been added so if you're a teacher who likes to use the manual list, you will need to check very carefully in case your favourites have either moved between lists or been removed altogether. If your old favourite is no longer in the manual lists, all is not lost. You can still use it as extra list material in the comprehensive examinations, provided its level of difficulty is in keeping with the grade. Series one was very successful and was warmly welcomed by the viola teaching community. It was such a relief to have a great selection of music in one volume, and it made viola so much easier to suggest as an option to students when there wasn't the financial penalty of having to buy several books of music for each grade. The series two grade books can be used on their own or together with the series one books, but you must use the new 2023 technical workbook. If you wish to keep using the 2000 and technical workbook while it is still allowed, you must only present material that was in the 2023 manual of syllabuses. So to be very clear, you cannot use the new series two books with the old 2007 technical workbook. But when in doubt, always check with your local AMEB office, please. Now something about performance notes. I had a sense of trepidation writing about writing these because all string teachers have their own approach to things and I really didn't want to step on any toes. So I had several audiences in mind when I was writing them. The first being a newly graduated teacher who wants a few quick pointers. The second, an experienced violin student transitioning to viola and exploring viola literature without the help of a teacher. And the third was a clever student learning in a group situation who's quicker than their peers and wanting further challenge. For those of you who don't fit my audience descriptions, you're free to use the notes to back up what you say to your students or you can ignore them. I don't want anyone thinking that I'm trying to teach them how to teach. Now note about fingerings and bowings. These are generally considered editorial in the grade books and in the manual list works. Teachers are free to change these according to the needs of their students. Uh, a note about dynamics. Dynamics that are not original to the composer are now in a much darker grey stippled font than is what is printed in series one. So you shouldn't have to write over them in pencil to make them legible. That used to take up a lot of part, time, part, a lot of time in my lessons when I was teaching a new piece. Also in the Haydn minuets in the new grade two book and the Papush Allegro in grade four, there were no dynamics at all in the original source material. 
So I've indicated in the performance notes that the dynamics I have put in can be altered according to taste. There's definitely scope to try out different dynamics and to engage students in the process of exploring alternatives. In the Josephine Trot study in grade four, the only dynamic was the initial piano and there was no fingering advice at all. So I've added to this quite extensively. Again, you should feel free to, the, to alter the dynamics if you wish, but remember that examiners would rather hear a musically interesting performance than one that slavishly adheres to the only dynamic the composer has indicated. And in Baroque music, or in any classical era, and in, in, in the times that people were writing music out by hand, often shortcuts were taken, mistakes were made, things were just not put in, and the musicians of the time were really expected to bring their own musical sensibilities to the interpretation of pieces. And I think the same is, is true of much of what is in these books. Uh, Cheerful Bells in grade one, list A, only had a forte marking at the start in the source publication. I have added dynamics for the performer and deliberately kept the, the dynamics in the duet part in tandem. So in the lesson, the teacher's dynamics will encourage the student to follow the markings in the same way. But if it was to be formed, performed as a duet, there are many more possibilities to bring out important motives in the upper part and then recede when the same motive is played in the lower part. And it can be fun to play around with these ideas in a lesson. The Odessa Bulgar in grade four, list C, is a wonderful piece. In my notes, I mentioned that no knowledge of klezmer ornamentation is required, but during my research for the performance notes, I came across the work of Chris Haig on YouTube and his use of ghost harmonics, which I'd never heard of before. Bars 28 and 29, um, there are two bars of the piece that are marked mezzo piano, sandwiched between two fortissimo sections. And I suggested in the performance notes that this would be a good spot to try ghost harmonics. It gives the teacher an opportunity to talk about tone color and how to vary the tone to make a performance more interesting. Um, and Thanks. finally, um, a note about the realization of ornaments. Um, all of the ornamentation that is written uh, in, into the pieces in level one does have a realization um, given um, for these ornaments. I was keen to reinforce that trills in the Baroque and classical period generally do begin on the upper note. And this creates a moment of dissonance with the underlying harmony. And that was the function of the trill to create a bit of dissonance. Realizations are introduced at grade one and a simple appoggiatura will suffice at this level. Again, the trills can be played according to taste but from grade two, I think it's reasonable to expect that students play a few repetitions in the trill rather than just a simple appoggiatura. I hope that you and your students enjoy exploring all the new material in the level one grade books. Putting them together was a huge process and there are a number of people to thank. Firstly, Stephen Hodgson, the publications editor who persisted and persisted, and eventually persuaded me to take up the challenge. It's been a fascinating endeavour, and I'm glad I did say yes. My panel of experienced teachers ranging in age from their 30s through every decade to their 70s. They gave up a Sunday afternoon last March to listen to all the works I was considering and help me whittle down the shortlist. Their input to the process was invaluable to the excellent staff at the Amy B Federal Office. Thanks for the encouragement, the great new arrangements and the advice on making my performance notes as clear as possible. But most of all, I need to thank Helen for access to her astonishingly large collection of music, her wide range of contacts in the viola world and her consistent help when I ran into problems. Um, our long friendship, had, that, that our long friendship has led up to the, this work for the viola community of Australia is something that's brought us both a great sense of fulfillment. And I sincerely thank you all. Well, thank you so much, Janice. That's just 
amazing. My old desk partner from College of the Arts days. Been a few few years since then. The new series two viola technical book um, has been my project. In preparation, as well as discussion with colleagues, I've also looked at many viola scale and technical books. All of these are listed in the manual of syllabus on page 145 under bibliography technique. And the selection has been collated into a PDF called resources. I've prepared five PDF support sheets, four related to the technical workbook and one generally on studying the viola to be emailed soon to everyone registered for today and made available online later by the AMEB. Now, level one. Since there are now so many more viola publications available since series one was published, the layout of the book now no longer includes all scales and arpeggios at the back. Instead, all requirements for each grade are now in the one place. There was general agreement across the string teaching community that our new viola technical book should correlate well in range, speeds and content to the current violin technical book in level one. So level one mirrors the current syllabus of the violin with some new material, particularly in exercises. A few exercises are identical to the violin syllabus, but down a fifth. These were highly recommended by teachers. New exercises have been created using the violin syllabus as a model with greater emphasis here and there on rhythm and non-diatonic or modal tonalities. Excellent non-compulsory extension exercises called extras for experts have also come from the violin syllabus. At times in our viola extras for experts, there's also encouragement to explore further by editing, reading, listening to or composing for the viola. With scales and arpeggios, fingering suggestions appear above and below the notes to suit various pedagogical schools. And with three octave scales, the Galamian turn at the beginning and end of each scale comes from the current violin book and is also optional. An important difference for viola students transitioning from the old series one violin syllabus is that from grade two onwards, arpeggio sequences rather than individual arpeggios need to be studied. On page eight and nine, key signatures in the alto clef and scale and arpeggio formations are outlined. Please investigate a confident understanding of the theory behind technical patterns and in a way that works this to ear training um, is vital at every stage of technical work. Thank you to the AMEB for providing that. Be confident too about learning French and Italian names of bow strokes and how they're to be performed. Use these names, legato, staccato, spiccato, as you teach. Detaché does not mean detached, for example. So many online videos demonstrate these strokes very well, too many to list, though some outstanding websites are listed in the resources sheet. Let's check out some features of level one. On page 11, <laughs> similarly at each grade, there's a list of regulations right above the index. Please check at every grade. Now to page 12 preliminary, one small difference from the violin technical work is that the tonic is not repeated and we have F major introduced instead of C. This is because C comes back in subsequent grades and the left hand finger pattern for F major is identical to the upper octave of C major two octaves. With F major, we also introduce the all important viola C string and we have pieces in F major at this level. In grade one, a reminder that no marks on the fingerboard are permitted in exams. As with preliminary, many similarities to the violin syllabus exist with an emphasis on movement, getting the gross motor movement to support the fine motor. On page 21, exercise 1D uses the pentatonic scale. That's something teachers might explore musically further with their students or otherwise just play as is. Grade two, on page 25, we find arpeggio sequences. You may like to revisit the key signature wheel on page eight to remind students about relative major and minor keys. So they make sense. On page 26, exercise 2A identifies by name two different approaches to fingering in chromatic scales. If I'm playing a rapid chromatic passage, say in something like Harry Potter, I'll tend to use the fingering pattern 0, 1, 2, 
one, two, three, four. However, in cantabile legato passages, the sideways sliding movement is more expressive. Here's an early chance to show students that context is everything in technical choices. Exercise 2B and 2C use open string keys deliberately to provide the drone cross-checking that an open string unison or octave can provide in building the one to four frame of the left hand. As children grow and move from one instrument to another in size, they need to constantly check and readjust the frame of that ever-growing left hand. So these exercises hopefully will give a solid grounding for shifting and double stops. On page 27, exercise 2D has syncopations in this Boeing study to build confidence in this very necessary skill for violists. Page 27, do we have that? Yes, good. Extras for experts, as well as the exercise, there are suggestions to explore, including composition. So let's encourage students to consider composition at all stages so they don't need to quit viola as teenagers to take up the guitar just because you can play your own music on the guitar. More links are on the deep dive technical book PDF sheet to this piece. On to grade three, page 29. Optional fingerings are given in scales and arpeggios, as various teachers strongly prefer one or the other. Professionals use both patterns depending on context, and studying both is also an option for the above average student. For exams, most teachers and students will be systematic and choose one. On page 31, arpeggio sequences also give the opportunity to discuss inversions of arpeggios. For example, bar nine is the subdominant of A major in second inversion giving a chance to educate the mind and ear as well as the fingers. On page 33, exercise 3A, the diminished preparation is written with those minimums specifically to build greater scope for listening, evaluating and hopefully accuracy. As an examiner, I find diminished sevenths to be an Achilles heel for quite a few violin and viola students, but essential for playing Wagner later on. Exercise 3D on page 34, sees robust rhythmic patterns and use of extreme ends of the bow, all very useful skills. Extras for experts is a real oral extension, tuning test, and another type of composition teaser. Yes, it's challenging, but it's optional. Up to grade four now. Here, the very big difference in, from series one is the introduction of three octave scales and arpeggios, which were previously introduced in grade five. While well, most students will be very excited about this, these two octave scales and arpeggios are also challenging with the various bow patterns and building greater fluency. So don't forget the two octaves as well. On page 42, exercise 4A is somewhat similar to the violin exercise, but in a tonal, um, a minor tonality. With exercise 4B, although this exercise is to be written as presented in the exam, on the C string, it could also be practiced on upper strings to build stamina and confidence. With exercise 4C on page three, 43, there is a very careful approach to intonation provided, including lots of open strings to build the frame of the left hand to approach double stops with confidence and security. Note the Boeing instructions. Intonation and tone control are related. Even hands separately with bow only can be useful on open strings um, before you put the left hand down. And to exercise 4D, thank you to Janet Fernandez for reminding me about the delights of Palashko studies. The deep dive sheet has more information on Palashko and the book of original viola studies this is taken from. On page 44, we finished level one with extras for experts. William Primrose was a great fan of studying barriolage stroke at a variety of speeds and with a silky but minimum amount of bow movement. This study also explores the fourth finger in first position with artificial harmonics added into the mix. Again, it's aimed at gently reinforcing the frame of those growing hands in first position, so important to consolidate as we advance up the fingerboard. 
Many thanks to the AMEB office again for help with preparing the material, particularly the page eight and nine. It's really wonderful to have that in our book. And it's now time for level two and certificate of performance. So I'll hand over to Raquel Bastos, who's done so much really terrific work in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. So uh, following from Janet's level one, uh, which is concerned with achieving parity between the violin and the viola, Level two aims to develop a sense of identity and brings forth those aspects that are unique to the viola. So a sense of independence from the other string instruments, mainly the, the violin, of course. And this independence is achieved through um, an emphasis on tone, tone development, repertoire that is specifically written for the viola. That was a, a very important consideration. Um, and also a focus on technical requirements that are particular to the viola, such as uh, fingering choices that support longer phrasing lines, taking into account the, the nevenness of viola strings, um, or tempi that are adequate to the instrument. Uh, for example, temp tempi that don't compromise the clarity of articulation or take into consideration, taking into consideration the, the longer response um, of the viola strings, for example. So um, the grade five and six books can be expected to become available later later this year, but this gives me the perfect opportunity to flag some great additions to the manual list in level two, and that includes the, now the new certificate. So I have uh, obviously a limited time today. I tried to choose some of the, the works that really excited me. Um, so let's delve into level two. Um, in level two, there is a larger number of original works across all grades, and that encompasses works from Baroque to the more modern era, which is really exciting. Um, there are significant additions uh, by women composers, both in Australia and abroad. Um, it is an updated syllabus that allows for great, great flexibility, or I am hoping that it allows for great flexibility and introduces students to new genres, styles and compositional techniques. Um, each list allows for different levels of difficulty to suit different student developmental needs and age differences as well. Um, and similarly to level one, we also moved a few works from list or across grades to an align, better align with current expectations of the re current requirements of other string instruments. So others have moved across lists, uh, but again, our main concern or my main concern and um, our principal consultants as well was um, in general, to leave works rather than deleting them, but, but add new ones. So teachers have choice. Uh, so I'm hoping with today's session, I can introduce you to a few of the works that have really um, excited me. And I hope you come to like them just as much as I do. Um, hopefully, I, I tried to gain, a, to, to with the works added, to add scope for different styles and musical interests, both teachers and students. So the lists are divided from grades five to eight, the lists are divided much like level one with list A and accompanied works. Um, and in list A, we go from in grade five, mainly studies, and then progressively to the certificate, mainly pieces and just a few studies, because then the certificate is meant to then bridge to level three, which has practically no studies in list A. Uh, so list A is an accompanied works um, progressively, as I said, into pieces with the certificate. So in list A, uh, they go um, uh, alongside the classics, such as the Kreutzer, the Mazas, the Campagnolis that, that were there and they still are, you can find studies that were written specifically for the viola, such as in grade five, Sitz, Hans Sitz study number 16 from the Practical Viola School, uh, which is uh, this really gorgeous melody uh, that helps develop tone and long legato bowing and expressive shifting. Um, help, uh, also in a key that it, it students learned in grade four, so they can now apply. Um, through, throughout level two, there are other original studies like Bruni studies, Hofmeister, Palaszko, Lillian Fuchs, and current composers such as Michael Kimber, the, the um, American violist Michael Kimber, who's written so much, he's so prolific, um, and his, all of his works are fantastic. 
Um, so the choice is varied in terms of styles and techniques. Uh, studied by Brazilian uh, in a, br a Brazilian chorito by Jeremy Cohen, American uh, composer Jeremy Cohen. So let's listen. In grade six, there's a study by Australian composer Andrea Kivel called A Study in Black that explore, explores chromatic sequences in a, um, and different rhythms, uh, different rhythmic patterns with a bow in an original way. So he applied in a duet version for violin because we didn't have a viola recording available. Uh, seven and eight, there is the introduction of studies by Michael Kimber, like I spoke before. So I encourage you to, to go and um, have a look at the manual lists. Uh, so as I said, um, there are great options to build a solid foundation of the with the classics uh, from the past, but also introducing new styles and looking into the future. With list B, uh, classical and Baroque, um, there are some recent some new editions of recently discovered baroque and classical composers the first example that i bring to you today is uh beatrice Matei's viola sonata written in the mid 18th century this piece is in grade six there is also a very cute sonatina in grade five by hoffman it's an original work for viola written in c major so it's just really perfect um, to allow students to explore the, the, the C major and in third position particularly. So very good for learning the classical style and, and consolidating third position. It's not too challenging. So um, if you have some students that might need a bit more time in grade five, that might be one good or a, or a transition from four to five, that might be a really good piece. Um, there are also two pieces from the album Leaves Opus 39 by Hans Sitt that are worth um, our attention. Now, another new addition uh, worth noting is Bruni's Viola Sonata, Opus 27, also original. Um, it's in C major in grade eight, written in classical style and accessible to all students in grade eight. This is, um, it's a short edition, so we don't, I'm not going to show PDF, but there's some exciting new works uh, for you to explore. In list C, so let's move on to the romantic style. Uh, across all grades, the inclusion of a, a number of works written for viola by Hans Sitt. Um, there's, there's, there were just so many beautiful works. Um, so I encourage you to explore them and they're all available on, on public domain. Such is the case of this Parker Roll. This is grades it listed in the grade six um, manual list. I'd like to lastly, just very quickly brief, uh, I would like to thank the team of consultants and the entire AMB team for their support and, and in answering emails at all hours. Um, I also would like to thank all the teachers that provided me with such valuable feedback along the way. It really allowed me to think much more deeply about what to include and what not to include or what not to exclude. <laughs> and a special thank you to Helen Tucky, whose long lasting passion for our instrument has driven her to acquire all things viola making her incredibly resourceful and knowledgeable. The AMEB couldn't have chosen a better principal consultant without her library, historical insight, and personal support. This syllabus would not be what it is today. So thank you and me out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Raquel, thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. I just can't wait to get really stuck into those um, level two works um, and I've already made a start with some of my students. What some wonderful finds that you've made there. So in the Viola Technical Workbook, Level 2 is about building the technical areas specific to the viola to support the musicianship and technical skills for Level 2 repertoire and beyond. Non-diatonic repertoire is a feature of much advanced solo repertoire. Listening remains a cornerstone for development. Orchestral excerpts were included because they're very likely to be encountered in the musical life of most students. A good general approach to level two is outlined in the technical work book two PDF that comes and also the deep dive PDF has got listening links to all excerpts. Today I'll mostly focus on newer areas, the exercises and orchestral excerpts starting on page 45. So do check the rules, particularly on fingering in exercises versus fingering in orchestral excerpts. This applies to all of level two. Now to grade five, page 54, exercise 5A. This was supplied by a very generous and talented string teaching colleague who's delighted to become at last a published pedagogue. 
The wide range of tempos gives scope to every student for accuracy as they ascend and descend the fingerboard. The exercise 5B is blues might be the only time a grade five student explores a major non-classical genre. However, the blues have origins from the mid 1800s. Many professional violists today play Motown as well as Mozart. There's also an excellent reinforcement for bowing right at the heel, which is needed in virtuosic works from many genres. On page 55, ex excerpt 5C, the March from Carmen demonstrates the viola moving straight from a bass line in the first 12 bars to join the tune, which change roles instantly like chameleons. On page 56, excerpt 5D, we have Bach Brandenburg 6. Pedagogical goals include the fluent use of first, second and third positions. It's also a mini how-to of bow use in the Baroque repertoire with exploration of the combination of speed and weight of bow. This double concerto is considered to be some of the greatest music of the Baroque period and was included to encourage students to listen to original and important repertoire for viola. Every international viola congress ends with the mass rendition of Brandenburg VI. On page 57, Extras for Experts, we find Berg excerpts from three pieces from orchestra written in 1928. Just like Ikea furniture, reading the instructions is vital, but it's all in the first or half position and quite playable. Following instructions and broadening musical outlooks are important skills necessary to prepare for wider and more advanced viola repertoire. On page 66, we go to grade six and find some interesting choices in double stops, I'm particularly grateful here to ideas from Roger Benedict's wonderful scale book. Different students need different finger patterns, particularly in thirds, depending on the shape of their hands and finger lengths. Page 67, exercise 68 is a favorite from the violin syllabus. And on page 68, we find exercise 6B, the whole tone pattern, very useful violas to explore as it can build alternate and rapid pathways up and down the fingerboard with minimal shifting, an important pattern and technique to support repertoire from many sources. Exercise 6C, sevenths, major and minor again, a brief exploration of an important interval. The deep dive sheet has more about this important French violist, composer and pedagogue, Maurice Vieux, and a listening link. Page 69, excerpt 60, Tchaikovsky, Romeo and Juliet Overture is very popular, so useful to polish. My colleagues all had completely different fingering ideas. With orchestral excerpts, we're always free to choose to suit our students. 6E, Strauss till Eulenspiegel, a great orchestral viola tune where various intervals, including the seventh, are explored again, however, in a very late romantic context. Grade seven, Page 75, 7.9, contains some useful features. Note bar 7 to the end, where the relationship between the diminished seventh and the chromatic scale is explored. The bowing remains in crotchets, so subdivision of the beat and the patterns are the highlight. If the bow is rhythmic, the left hand will move more confidently too. Page 76, 7.10. The final line has some good alternative fingerings. Remember Primrose's words not to be bound by any one system. The more systems mastered, the greater the ultimate command of the instrument. More about that on those sheets too. Page 77, 7.11. Artificial harmonics are very important for violists and building confidence is easier with rhythmic bowing. This exercise also reinforces the ability to articulate the same passage identically with reverse bowing. Page 79, exercise 7a, is another violin syllabus favourite. 7b, Haydn Symphony 96, is one of the London symphonies dubbed the miracle due to an adventure with a falling chandelier. Encourage in listening to this excerpt is very important for style and sound. Page 80, 7c, Berlioz Roman Carnival, is another great viola section solo and audition favourite. Um, 7D is the final bars that are the end of the marathon that is Mahler's fifth symphony. These two very short extracts, which should be played with, that, with a gap, will be over in less than 30 seconds. In the presto, the whole tone scale dashes dramatically upwards, finishing with short, crisp diatonic chords. Page 81, Extras for Experts, is a lovely cool-down routine for eliminating tension after the intensity of everything that's in grade seven.
Now to grade eight, page 92, 8A, Grieg is such a popular piece and it's an example of arpeggios and fingering choices in context. Page 93, 8B, Bruckner, will not often come up in youth orchestras and amateur orchestras, but this is the section solo that demonstrates the need for excellent listening to enharmonic passage works and very interesting cadential resolutions. Listening to various interpretations is highly recommended, and the same goes for 8D, Mahler 10, which we won't show today, but the same principle. Page 94, 8C, Mozart Requiem, is a staple of the concert repertoire. This excerpt looks, this looks deceptively simple. Warning, it's definitely not, so don't leave it until the last minute to study. Build a bit of stamina. Page 96, 8E, is a contrast to the previous three excerpts. This is a place where the viola counter melody steals the limelight from the lyrical waltz tune and a happy place to end a grade eight exam. Page 97, Extra for Experts, is from the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra with the great viola melody with interesting intervals and tonal centres. It was written around the same time as the viola concerto, so a perfect opportunity to explore Bartok and the context of his important concerto in level three. Speaking of level three, we are amazingly glad to benefit from the experience and wisdom of Roger Benedict, who's done so much wonderful work with me on this section. Thank you so much, Roger. He can't be with us here today, but he's kindly made us a recorded presentation. Hello, I'm Roger Benedict, and I've been the consultant for the Level 3 syllabus. I've been uh, very lucky to work with Helen, with Janet and Raquel on this project. Their wisdom, their depth of knowledge and their incredible commitment to this enormous task uh, have been really amazing. So it's very much a team effort. Um, I'll just talk briefly about the ideas behind Level 3 lists, mention a few uh, new works that we've added uh, and talk about the requirements. I guess um, my perspective in a way is very much based on being a teacher at tertiary level and seeing students um, after they've finished these exams and seeing where their gaps in knowledge are in their musicianship, in their playing. I do teach uh, Elmas and Amos students from time to time, but I'm sort of looking at it also from the next step beyond those exams. Um, when it comes to putting together a program at AMAS or ELMAS level, we have somewhat simplified the requirements to give more freedom of choice um, and also to avoid some confusion about composers' periods or, or styles. So we've removed the stipulation about style or period, so you don't have to try and work out whether a composer is romantic or post-romantic. Um, so for AMAS, candidates should prepare a programme of between 25 and 40 minutes, including gaps between the pieces. There are now just three lists. So there's a list A, which is unaccompanied works. There's list B, which is works originally written with piano or keyboard accompaniment. And there's list C, which is works originally written with orchestral accompaniment, obviously performed with piano in the exam. Um, candidates uh, must prepare at least three works, one from each of lists A, B and C, and then further works to make up the time of the programme may be drawn from any of or all of lists A, B and C at the candidate's discretion. And we say no more than one work may be by any composer should be selected. So for ELMAS, um, candidates should prepare a programme of not less than 35 minutes and not more than 50 minutes. That's just uh, the same as it was previously. We have the same three lists. List A is unaccompanied works. List B is works originally written with piano. And list C is works originally written with orchestral accompaniment. So a much simpler um, and a much simpler list system. Um, candidates must prepare at least three works, again one from each of the lists, A, B and C, and then they can pick additional works uh, from any of the lists as they see fit. Exactly the same as they must. No more than one work by any composer is to be selected uh, in this as well. Um, and uh, importantly with Elmas, one complete work must be presented from memory. Which work or works, um, that's not stipulated, but the convention of course is that solo works, in other words unaccompanied works and concertos, 
can be memorized, but not necessarily sonatas. And I think that's a good guideline. But there's no, no, there's no rule. Of course, sonatas are real chamber music works, and we like to see uh, students really engaging with their pianists who are on the same kind of, um, yeah, playing on the same page, as it were. So this simpler format means candidates can specialize to a certain extent if they have an affinity with a certain type of music, say with uh, new music or, or 20th century music. Um, but the main idea is that it should give candidates lots of freedom, lots of choices in creating an artistically satisfying, well curated program. And at this level, of course, the candidates should um, all be able to play the works at a very high level. But we want them to also understand how to create a balanced and interesting program showing some artistic and thoughtful curation. Maybe even find a theme that connects all the works together to give the recital a strong overriding sense of narrative as one would putting together a, a normal recital. Um, finding themes, maybe um, finding personal connections between composers, say Shostakovich and Britain, who were friends. Maybe a focus on, on women composers. Maybe focusing on music that was inspired by dance. Of course, Bach Suites have got dance movements. Ross Edwards wrote a wonderful dance piece uh, or song. Music inspired by song. Britain's Lacrimae could go with lots of other things. Uh, fairy tales, nature, anything that joins music together. Folk music, Hindemith's Van Andrea and Ligeti Sonata are both influenced by folk music. Maybe pieces written for a particular player, uh, William Primrose or Lionel Turtis, for example. Um, we haven't removed too much from the old syllabus um, and hopefully haven't removed that one piece that you love teaching. Um, but you'll notice a few things. Um, firstly, there are less studies in List A, especially in Elmas, in favour of more musically uh, demanding solo pieces. Um, there are some new editions of standard works, especially uh, some newer Urtext editions. The Brahms Sonatas is a good example of this, and we've updated the suggested edition to the new Clive Brown Bärenreiter Brahms, which came out a couple of years ago. And this, um, there's lots of contention about some of these pieces, uh, because um, in a way, thinking on, on these, the Brahms Sonatas has changed a lot over the years. So from playing the original Brahms arrangement, which is what I always learnt, and then after that people suggested that Brahms hadn't had enough influence on that arrangement, and then we went to the clarinet version with higher octaves. Thomas Riebel published a version with lots of the higher octaves. Then there's Primrose's version, which uh, changes quite a lot of things. But Clive Brown, in this latest edition, believes that there's no evidence to suggest that Brahms's version is anything but authentic. So now we go back to playing the lower octaves. Basically, there are lots of choices, but I think it's a good place to start from. So trying to keep up with, with the latest scholarship and the latest editions. For the Bach violin, sonatas and partitas, the transcription for viola, uh, we suggest the Simon Rowland Jones Peters edition, which is also quite recent. Um, and it's a beautiful, um, you know, very, very beautiful to play from that edition. There's a new edition of the Paganini Caprices for viola, which I think is, is a big improvement. So we put that one in. Um, and then um, there are some better arrangements. I think they're better arrangements of pieces that have been in the syllabus before, um, newly published. For example, the Stravinsky Suite Italienne, which actually is, a, I think, a great piece on the viola. There's a new edition by Busy Hawks, edited by Kim Kashkashian. So we've put that one in. What else do we have? Well, uh, lots of uh, new works by women composers. So there's Sally Beamish, a beautiful solo piece by Sally called Ariel or Ariel for viola solo. Uh, there's a piece by Joan Tower called Wild Purple. She believes the color purple is associated with the viola and there's been lots of pieces based on that color. Uh, Margaret Sutherland's Sonata, which was not in the syllabus before, is there. And that's actually a really uh, great piece, beautiful piece. There's a concerto by Holly Harrison, great uh, up and coming young composer uh, called Hot Wire. That was premiered by Steph Farrens for, um, with TSO, I think. That's an Amos piece. There's a piece by Kate Moore, Tarantella for solo viola, and a piece by Elizabeth Unan, uh, Fantasia for, for solo viola. 
And of course, those last ones are all Australian composers. We've got a few more Australian works in there, I think, um, including actually a, a, not a new piece, but a piece by Malcolm Williamson, Partita for Viola, on themes of Walton. So that's based on the Walton Concerto. Again, that might make a nice combination with uh, the Walton. I think it's in the same... Uh, no, that's Amos. Forgive me. Uh, there's another Matthew Heinzen piece, there's a Brett Dean piece, and there's a George Lentz piece. And the Brett Dean and George Lentz pieces, um, which are for solo viola, are, um, they're not easy. Yeah, they're not easy pieces, they're quite difficult. And I've probably widened the range of difficulty within each list somewhat, in both Amos and Elmas. And I think I've done that because there are so many talented and wonderfully intelligent viola players who need to be challenged in a particular direction. Again, it offers a wider range of challenges for each level. It kind of um, gives more choice, but it also allows people to follow something they're really interested in and, and meet challenges that they um, you know, can meet. So, so there's quite a range, I think. And of course, even at Elmas, players are still developing. There's no such thing as a perfectly rounded, uh, finished, perfect viola player. It doesn't exist. We've included pieces um, written for the Paris Conservatoire examinations from the early part of the 20th century. Those are really virtuosic, beautifully crafted and very satisfying to play. Again, there are recordings of all these pieces, so there's plenty of um, resources that we can, uh, we can find um, to inspire us to play them. There's a piece by Leon Thierke, there's a piece by Leon Onohe, um, and there's other virtuosic French works as well, which I think fill a very important gap in our repertoire. Pieces by Philippe Gobert, Joseph Jongen, Charles Kirkland, people like this, just to name a few. So a few, a few new things amongst a lot of the old favourites there. And I, you know, I'd urge you to kind of look into the, the less well-known repertoire, you know, it's very easy to go with the things that we, we sort of know and love, but to find a few other pieces that really suit someone's playing, suit someone's temperament. There's a few other pieces I was going to mention. Uh, I put in a movement from one of the Britain solo cello suites, which were recently published by Faber in an arrangement by Nobuko Imai, who's also recorded them. And those are really, they're difficult pieces, but excellent. And this one movement, I think, is a good addition. Beautiful piece by Thomas Addis, the English composer called Three Berceurs. Uh, that's an Amaz piece. And I put that in also because there's a wonderful recording online of Lawrence Power playing it. Uh, and again, I think if there's a really good model of someone playing a piece, it's, it's great to include it. Um, there's a piece by Silvestro, the Ukrainian composer. And there's also some preludes by Casimir Ney, um, who is a French uh, composer, wrote these preludes originally for viola. Um, it's like our Paganini in a way. They're quite virtuosic and again, very useful pieces to have amongst all those other ones. Um, it's hard to find new concertos to add, but I have added two movements from the Elgar Cello Concerto. Um, and again, partly because of a performance. Timothy Ridout, a wonderful English viola player, um, made a recording of the Elgar, um, came out last year. And it's a really remarkable recording. It won gramophone, concerto recording of the year beat all the other concertos for other instruments so i think if you can win a concerto award playing the elgar cello concerto on the viola it's a really good sign so i've put that one in there's the schnick concerto one movement from that as well um so hopefully we've, we've added a few few more um tasty morsels to these lists now i think most of the repertoire uh listed can be found on youtube and other platforms on Spotify, Apple Music, and Apple Classical, which is a new platform I'd um, really worth checking out. The quality of Apple Classical is really good. Um, and I just get your students to, to do lots of research. Go to the American Viola Society and read their journal, the New York Viola Society, um, and of course, uh, the Australian New Zealand Viola Society. They can all join that and just be part of a community. I think being part of a viola community makes a big difference, makes you feel supported, makes you feel like you're doing something really... Um, you're not on your own, you're not working on your own. And Facebook, um, there's a wonderful Facebook Violists page. Um, join that because you get lots of uh, interesting information. You can ask questions, you can pose a question and, and a you know, great player will answer it for you. So lots of ways of really joining 
joining together with other other similar musicians. Anyway, I hope you enjoy looking through the new syllabus. Thank you all for the great work you do with your students. Bye bye. Thank you so much to Roger for sending that through uh, on the new level three lists for viola syllabus, level three, of course, being associate and licentiate. Um, there are a couple of very short uh, questions that I'd like to run through. Um, if you do have anything really urgent, please do send it through and we'll either try to answer it right now. Um, otherwise, you can reach us on online at ameb.edu.au uh, and we'll, we'll answer the questions directly. So two questions that have come through. Firstly, in the exam, do the students choose the position of their scales and arpeggios or does the examiner choose? Um, do you want to cover this, Helen? Yes, the, absolutely. It's your choice. The original, the series one, book had no fingerings for that reason that fingering choices in scales and arpeggios are individual the including um in the book they're, they're only there for suggestions and to help that's right some of the fingerings for the technical exercises are mandatory yes. but only for the reason that uh there's there's often a particular position or a particular fingering uh, aspect of, of left hand technique that we're trying to uh, yeah. put into that exercise. So that's the only reason those are obligatory. But any systematic uh, yeah. logical fingering for scales and arpeggios is acceptable uh, in examinations. Um, the second question that's come through is uh, if we are presenting a grade eight repertoire exam in 2024 with a 2023 manual syllabus, uh, can we include 2024 manual list pieces? I'll, I'll cover that. Um, so for two years, starting this year, there is a transition period and you can uh, submit for examination either using the old syllabus or the new syllabus, but you can't mix the two. So this year and next year until the end of 2025, you can use either the old syllabus or this new syllabus, but you can't mix the two when presenting for exams. However, a number of uh, pieces have been retained on the new syllabus. And so it's probably worth, if, if you want to uh, explore some of this new repertoire, uh, it's worth checking out the new syllabus to see if your favorite 2023 syllabus uh, pieces have been retained. It may be that you can, you can uh, have your cake and eat it too there. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really come to the end of our time here. Thank you so much, Helen, Janet, and Raquel, and also to Roger um, for, well, both for, for the presentation today, but also for the, the enormous amount of work. Uh, there's been a few comments coming through, some from previous consultants who know very well exactly how much work is involved in putting a new syllabus together. Um, so thank you, Helen, Jane, uh, uh, Helen, Janet, Raquel, and Roger. Um, and, and to our specialist review panel, Loretta Finn, Danielle Arcaro and Phoebe Green, um, as well as the AMEB publishing team, Laura Vaughan, who was the project officer for the Series 2 grade books, uh, David Howell, our typesetter, and our team of expert arrangers and proofreaders. Um, I'd also like to thank the behind the scenes AMEB team, especially Bernard de Pasquale, AMEB CEO, and Maxine Day, Fiona Ng, and Nketi Anel for making this online workshop possible. Uh, and last but certainly not least, to everybody who's attended this workshop. Uh, we really hope that these new resources, the grade books, the technical work, the site reading, and of course the syllabus itself, uh, prove to be an incredibly valuable uh, resource and serve the viola community um, and inspire teachers and students for many years to come. Um, thank you all of our presenters today one more time. Uh, and from all of us, goodbye and have a wonderful rest of your Sunday.